is that
to say we have a very special and important guest with us here this morning who's come all the way from Kingston. Oh, oh, so, oh, 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 oh. And we can all welcome Sophia. Sunday, if you happen to bring something for the food bank, uh, the food fill the bucket, if you forgot, uh, the plate is there for cash and they can buy stuff today. It was absolutely positive, it was not event, so we've left our food. Oh, no. It's always the last Sunday of the month. Right? No, it's the fourth, right? So, you know what I did, Kathy? This is, this is how I started to retrain myself. And I started last month and worked, so I did it again. Is I just put the stuff in the car. So that regardless of when the Sunday happens, I can just go in the car. Because I, I understand, I'm the same way. I, I forget. I even forget. I need to bother this for you. Well, it's nice that you guys have a wonderful Sunday morning argument, and everything is going to be okay. <laughs> Excellent. Who won that one? So while we're in a mood of frivolity, I also want to um, uh, announce that we have a, an opportunity for continued frivolity this Saturday at 4 o'clock at the Knudsen's. Yes, yes. Because the Knudsen's have had the great pleasure of having eight or nine? Mm, eight now. Eight. Yes. Oh. No, eight, yes. Yeah. yes. Okay, eight surviving pigments <laughs> that need to have some attention lavished upon them. So we're going to have a piggy potluck yes. at the Knudsen's at 4 o'clock this Saturday. Is that correct? Yes. Is there anything particular that you think we should bring? Is there a theme? Probably or? not. Yeah. Probably not. considering relocating. There's nothing been decided. It's just in prayer. Um, but I wouldn't want it to be like we're going out and doing stuff and not telling you guys. Um, and um, so what's that? Yeah, so, you know, we're, we're open for people to speak into our lives and to give their opinion. Of course, uh, God uses everybody in the body. And uh, right now, we're, it's just been brought to prayer. And you can ask us, what's that? 
But are you giving me the look for some? <laughs> <laughs> September. Yeah, we are. We are going to take a trip to Tennessee, September fourth through the seventh. So, um, I just I wouldn't want it to be like just come across like, hey, see you later, right? right, 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 right. right. I hope everything works out because we 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 put our life here. We moved. We built the house um, out on Tiedman specifically uh, because. You know, unless the Lord did something else, we were planning to be here forever. Um, you know, and so, yeah, I just wanted to be upfront. There's really nothing else I could add. Yes, Kathy. I was going to say, if everybody's going to be praying, you can pray for me because I have to know them first. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not going to be here. So, yeah. I'm be either out of a job or see. Right, so this is something, I mean, this is a call to prayer, right? Yes. And so in our time of prayer together, these are some of the things that we can begin to be lifting before the Lord. We're in new and uncharted territory, um, and, um, and so, yeah. And when I say we're open for, like, uh, anything and directed at me, please, <laughs> it's ultimately I'll be the one making the decision. Brooke and I counsel and we talk, about, but that's my job is, is the leader and the head of the home. Um, so if you're like mad and feel betrayed okay. or anything like that, well, I'm just throwing that out there. I wouldn't want you to not tell me, right, if that's how you're feeling, because uh, that's understandable. Well, I, mean, I will definitely feel right. perturbed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this is something that Pastor Don and I have discussed, and I've discussed it uh, with JP and maybe a few others. But I wouldn't want it to be a secret. Yeah. So, you know, and I feel what? A secret. A secret. And then for us to just spring it on you guys. And, you know, again, so we don't have a timetable. We are taking a trip. Um, but, like, right now the market, right, for our house is higher. Just like everybody else's houses is higher. Mm -hmm. um, and we just, we just want to be wise. So you can pray for wisdom, but that we would walk by faith. Yeah. So, thanks. Right. Yes, Lee. We'll also be praying that God will change your mind. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm serious. We need you. Did you? Were you here uh, when Shokat was here? And his missionary work that he does over in um, Afghanistan, Afghanistan, all of those places. You know, we are going to suffer and we are going to face persecution, and we need. We, we need can have a private other. conversation about that. That would be nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Um, also, the yarn is over there. It's all brand new yarn. Anybody that would like to take some, please. I got them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. Way to go. Yeah, uh, I hope that it will all disappear today. So. Well, if it doesn't, we'll just yeah. You know, so I, I don't even know who out there loves to uh, knitting. Well. Okay. So, oh, I'd love to do that. Oh. I'm going to learn. Well, maybe someone could give I'm you a yeah. tutorial. Uh, no, no. <laughs> Just because, so Carol is the one person I know who is fantabulous. Yeah. Right? I'll make you all laugh. Uh, so it's, it's nice to, it's, it's a treasure to be a part of a church family that actually seeks to function as a family. So I appreciate the, just even being able to talk about some of these things openly. So, um, and yes, we are all emotionally invested in one way or the other. So, but we give it to the Lord. And the only time I visit is when we really draw close to the Lord. Yes, absolutely. Everything's going well. Oh, well, I don't feel anything today, Lord, but I'm glad you're there, but... It makes us claim to him more. Yes, Amen. absolutely. Amen. Well, with that note of encouragement, mm -hmm. let us prepare to worship with the prayer. Mm -hmm.
Please stand and call to worship Psalm 134. Come, bless Yahweh, all you servants of Yahweh, who stand by night in the house of Yahweh. Lift up your hands to the holy place and bless Yahweh. May Yahweh bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. Let us sing to his praise. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, in 210, followed by Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing.
O Heavenly Father, our hearts and our whole beings to you to guard and protect because we do recognize the sinfulness of our own native flesh that uh, even though we, you have given to us a new nature and you have give, bestowed upon us the blessing of your Holy Spirit, still we war in this in between the times before we uh, reach the glory that you have promised to us and we struggle, we do. And so we just offer to you in this moment, once again, our, our whole beings, our hearts, that you would guard and protect and guide, and that in all things we do as we walk forward step by step, that we might strive and seek to honor you and to have you glorified in everything we do and say and, and think and intend, and, and et cetera. But that also, right, I didn't cover it. But also that when we fail, that you will, in your strong and severe grace, grab us back up and return us to your way. That even in our failing and returning, honor and glory will be given to you in Jesus' yes. name we pray. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you. Let us greet one another in the Lord. Hey! Ah. <laughs> This morning is old uh reading is Mark chapter 14 verses 32 through 36. JP speak up. Yes. Yeah. And they read like this. This is Mark chapter 14, 32 through 36. And they went to a place which was called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. And he took with him Peter and James and John. And he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even unto death. Remain here and watch. And going a little further, he fell on the ground, and he prayed that if it were possible, that the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible to thee. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what thou wilt. Amen to that. Yeah. And to help remind us of this in song, I would like to call the children forward. We're just going to sing uh, the first verse of Trust and Obey. It's hymn 571 if you don't know it. Um, children, I'm just going to remind you of the words. I don't know. Uh, it, when we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still. All the trust in the When we walk with the Lord in the light of His word, what a glory He sheds on our way. While we do His good will, He abides with us still, and with all. to 
suffer at the Taliban's hands. And Lord, there is, they have no defense but you. They have no one that they can trust in and turn to you in this time but you. And Lord, we just plead with you that you would pour out your hand of protection upon them, that, you're, that you do not allow your church to be wiped out, but that you would uphold, and even in your sweet and wonderful way to turn it around rather than wiping out the church, the church can grow through this, Lord. Um, I just plead for them in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And let us close together saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I can call forward the ushers at this time who will receive the offering. to both what we 
want to do in our sinful inclinations and what the way of the world is. So there's set up this stark contrast between what we want and what he wants. And it is ours who claim his name and to follow the Lord, to enter that trajectory of learning to want what he wants. And I say trajectory, and I say learn, because that's what it is, a process. The important thing, as in all matters of obedience to the will of God, is to begin that process and stay in that trajectory in following, yes he is, the Lord. And so with men, it's basically leading out in, take, taking a leadership position in the worship of God's people. You know, the part for the whole, uh, represented by lifting holy hands in prayer. And to do that without anger or disputing or quarreling, what is, what, what is it that we, uh, as men by nature, want to do? I mean, men, we're warriors. That's part of how God designed us. God gave us testosterone for a reason. Look at the animal world. Well, if we're simply nothing more than animals, then that's what we are. But we're not. We're more. We're, we're made in the image of God. And so he calls us to direct our innate nature in a way that is honoring to him. So not being combative, hot-tempered and fighting, but also women. It's to adorn themselves with modesty and good works, Amen. as opposed to being obsessed with the outward glamour and sexualizing, etc. The outward appearance, uh, which is so dominant, both in our proclivity and in our culture. Okay, let's unwrap this a bit more together. And I want to look at how the Apostle Paul, or the Lord through the Apostle Paul, wants to reorient Christian men and reorient Christian women. So first, the reorientation of Christian men. This is what Paul addresses in verse 8. And basically, it is a call for the men of the church to take up active leadership in the worship and workings of the church, but to do so without being overbearing, domineering, or abusive in any way. And both sides of that are very important. Number one, taking leadership. And number two, without being combative. Okay, so one, taking leadership. And I want to just take a look at each of the phrases that Paul uses here to describe this for us, beginning with, in every place. Verse 8, Paul says, I desire then that in every place. So that means, just to be clear, not just in Ephesus or the various house churches in Ephesus, but in churches everywhere, wherever they may be. This is made abundantly clear in the usage of this very same phrase in the Greek and topo, uh, and pantitapo in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2 where he says to the church of God that is in Corinth together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. There in every place is placed in contradistinction to Corinth. He intentionally broads it out from there to everywhere. And so what this means then for us is that this is a word to the men of this church, the Long Branch Church. God is directing something to you and me. What does he want us as Christian men to do? Well, and then he tells us. He says the men should pray. This praying, by the way, isn't just something random or out of the blue. Remember, we're in the middle of a flow of thought that was initiated up in verse 1 and go, went all the way through verse 7, strenuously advocating, right, urging us all to pray for the salvation of all people, including, notably, uh, people in power. That was particularly relevant back then, and it continues to be particularly relevant today. So here Paul is intentionally picking up from what he had just said, but he's pointing out the men first and putting the onus particularly on them. We, if I 
can include us, me and with the men here that are with, with me today. We are to be particularly involved in leading out in prayers for the salvation of all people. Our government, with everything that's going on, our unsaved loved ones, certainly, um, and, and for those who so rapidly oppose the gospel and those who bear it, like, you know, like the Taliban that is reascendant in Afghanistan. And again, Lord, protect your people. And again, this is the particular, this is in the particular context of the workings of the church. Remember the thematic anchor, and I'm going to call it that, the thematic anchor in chapter 3, verse 15. So this speaks, yes, specifically to leading out in the worship of the church. Thus the men of the church are encouraged to take a more active leadership role in the worship and workings of the church. Of the church. So hopefully I said that enough times and enough permutations that you guys got it, right? Sweet. And then he illustrates that call to prayer with the descriptive lifting holy hands. Lifting hands is one of the primary postures of prayer that we see example in the scriptures, and perhaps we need to recapture that more. For example, when Solomon gave his prayer of dedication for the newly constructed temple of God in Jerusalem, it says, 1 Kings 8, verse 22, Then Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven. We see this as well in Psalm 28, verse 2. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands toward your most holy sanctuary. That is... In heaven. It's a way of lifting our hearts, our whole beings, up to the Lord and before the Lord. The posture reflects and informs the intent. We are body and spirit together. And we are meant and they are meant to function together. It's not the only appropriate posture by any means. Elsewhere we read, for example, in Psalm 95, verse 4, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before Yahweh, our Maker. Again, a most appropriate posture of desperate pleading, of humility, and of submission. Again, perhaps we need to recapture that more as well. Yeah. Like our Lord himself in the Garden of Gethsemane, it says, Matthew 26, verse 39, that he fell on his face. Not the picture we usually see or think of, is it? I mean, there's a picture I still, I don't know, maybe one of these days I'll take it down, but you know all the holy pictures of Jesus, and they, um, they obscure just his very essence. Yes. So it has him kind of sitting at this rock, looking up, and he's got this kind of halo, and it's all peaceful. And in the garden of Gizem. Mm -hmm. But that's not what the scriptures say. They say he yeah. fell on his face. Mm -hmm. And prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I mean, he was wrestling. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he is the paradigm for us all. But coming back, the emphasis here is on the quality of the hands that are lifted. He says, lifting holy hands. This speaks to an emphasis on purity of life, the necessity of a sanctified life set apart to the Lord, living for the Lord. Before we ever lift those hands, we need to make sure that they are holy. As it says in Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, Who shall ascend the hill of Yahweh, and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now that's not sinless perfectionism by any means. That is impossible for us to do this side of heaven. But it is a genuineness of faith that seeks the Lord and walks in his way. And when we fall, to turn back to him and to walk in his way. James, in his letter, echoes and builds on this psalm when he says, this is chapter 4, verses 8 and 10, Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. Yes, humble yourselves.
themselves. And then lift those holy hands and pray. Because the bottom line is this. Men need to take ownership of their responsibility to be active in the church and in the leadership of the church. As a husband is considered by God to be the head of the home and to take leadership role in the spiritual health and growth of his wife and children. That's Ephesians 5 and 6. Maybe one of these days we'll get there. So men, and especially a particular subset of men when we get to the overseers, elders, pastors at the beginning of chapter 3, but here more broadly all men who are seeking to live genuinely godly lives, we are called to step forward and step up and step into our calling. Yes, the women are also to pray, as is expressly given in 1 Corinthians 11, lifting up holy hands as well. That is understood, but the men are specifically called to do so, and they are called first. There's something to that that we are to see and take note of and take to heart. So men, are you up to the task? Yep, good question. By the power of Jesus, yes. All of those answers are great. Thank you, man. And number two, without being combative. Paul says for the men to do all this, verse 8, without anger or quarreling. And this certainly cuts against our innate and sin-stained tendencies. As I mentioned at the outset, God built testosterone into our systems. It's part of what makes males males and men men. It's part of what's been God given for us to fulfill our duties and call colleagues, not just be providers, but, but protectors, to run toward the flying bullets, to run into the burning building, to stand between the invader and your family, to stand for what is right in the face of daunting odds. But taken into a sin-stained direction, this turns into aggression and violence like we see in the animal kingdom with regard especially to bulls and others competing for the harem. I love watching the animal things, but boy, they can get brutal. Mm -hmm. And too easily we descend into animalia instinct. This is not what God intends for us who uniquely and above all are made in his image. But actually our tendencies can turn into one of two directions. Aggressiveness, yes, or passivity. Aggressiveness, like what Paul specifically outlines here without anger or quarreling, but also passivity, like how Paul began his charge to the men, step up to the plate. Pray, lifting holy hands. Too often and for too long, men, for whatever reason and for various reasons, even when I first came to this church 10 years ago, who were filling almost all of the leadership positions in this church? It was not the men. And that is a shame. It's not that women aren't also to be in leadership. There is absolutely a place for women in leadership among God's people. And we'll explore that more even as we go through this letter. But passivity is not an option if you are going to be a Christian man. But for various reasons, right, have been content to simply step back and let women take the lead in everything. Whether that's for selfish escapism, gives me more time to fish, or play video games, or watch sports, or philander without consequence, or whatever. Or whether it's because we've been berated and demeaned so much as in, I think it's been almost 50 years, maybe 50 years, a woman needs a man like a fish needs a bicycle. Now let that sink in and make you real feel like you're important, doesn't it? <laughs> um, all the sitcoms and the stereotypes don't help. And also the, all the actual chauvinists and deadbeats and abusers don't help either. Then it's just easier to, to roll over and stay quiet and keep passive. Or because we haven't had any good 
male role models to show us what it means to be a godly man of strong character and dauntless courage, which our boys especially so desperately need. Men, you are vital and important for the children and what will become the leaders and the direction of this country. Godly men stand up to the plate, lead in godliness. We need you. But now Paul centers on the aggression side of things, being hot-tempered and picking fights. You know, get young bucks together, stir the pot, and see what happens. The posturing, the inflammatory language, and the physical altercations. Or like what Paul will say of the false teachers later on in chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, he has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction. That's certainly our nature, our sin nature, but it's not our new nature, and we are called to actively put off the old self and put on the new. To put off your old self, it says in Ephesians 4, verses 22 and 23, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. And we could sure hang out a long time on that phrase. And be renewed in spirit, in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. In fact, one of the marks of the overseer particularly is that he must be, as it says in chapter 3, verse 3, we'll get there in a couple weeks, gentle, not violent, and not quarrelsome. Something that is echoed in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, where it says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. You know, all of that. In fact, to underscore the seriousness of this call on our lives, the Apostle Peter lets us in on a powerful secret. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7, he says to us married men, likewise husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Literally, that's according to knowledge. That is, you've got to know your wife and understand what she's like. Because she's not like any other woman. She is uniquely made as a, as a particular spouse for you in the image of God. And you need to attend to her with the best of your abilities. And, and guys, that, that's a journey, right? Likewise, husbands. <laughs> I, hey, I'm on the journey, right? We're all on the journey, right, Carol? Yes. Hey, man. Uh, likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. If you're not a considerate husband, mistreating or even just not attentively treating your wives, then God simply won't listen to your prayers. Ah, I mean, they might sound great, but they're pointless. We'll be, just be speaking empty words into the air. Yes, the Lord wants us as men to take that active role, to lead out in prayer and worship and work of the church, but they've got to be holy hands that we're lifting and holy hands Begin at home. Too many people, too many men, have lived that double life, polished on the outside, but corrupt on the inside. Holy at church, but horrid at home. The Lord is watching. Okay, that's the reorientation of Christian men. Second, the reorientation of Christian women. So just FYI, I'm stepping on everyone's toes today. <laughs> stepping on my own toes, even. All right. That's probably why people don't 
choose to preach out of this letter a lot. <laughs> You're bolder than most. Well, I've been enc encouraged in that direction, so I thank you for all those who have been an encouragement toward boldness. So. We love you for it. <laughs> As we would expect, right, Paul next turns to the women in the church in verses 9 and 10, where it says, Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and goals or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. And as you notice, for the women, he talks about clothes and hair, right? Because what do women, again, I'm speaking as an outsider, but I do observe things. What do women so typically get obsessed with? over clothes and hair. Look at the women's magazines. Look at all of the women's marketing. Men don't typically struggle with these things. Most of us don't relish clothes shopping, for example. But women do, in speaking genetic generally. And not that clothes and hair are bad. I mean, we all need them. Some of us less than others. <laughs> and we want to look attractive and not just functional. And that's not bad, but it is bad if it becomes our focus and inordinate use of our money, energy, time, and attention. But that's where the with it culture was in Paul's day, and it's certainly where the with it culture is in our own day as well. Think of Amen. the real housewives. If any of you watched any of those myriad spin-offs, you know, the real housewives of Orange County, the real housewives of Beverly Hills, the real housewives of New Jersey, the real housewives of New York, the real housewives of Atlanta, the real housewives of the Potomac. Did I miss any? Well, you haven't got that video. <laughs> but I, full confession, I can't stand them. Yeah. Uh, but they are front and center in our culture's way of thinking and priorities and desires. And they're not about real housewives at all. I mean, at least not the normal, everyday, average ones. They're about the elites. Those who have the money. Those who can fill their lives with the most lavish of lifestyles, including outlandish clothing and hair, and whose lives are consumed with selfishness, immaturity of character, seductive dress, gossip, and slander. But hey, it's popular. It sells. People watch them by the millions. So here we are again today. In Paul's day, that looked like, you know, the elaborate plating of the hair, often intertwined with gold, hung with gems and pearls, and lavish attire, and the leading ladies of fashion led with these, and the masses followed. Even the church was not immune from the draw of this ostentation and seductiveness. And whenever we get lost in our looks, and showing off better than others, we fall into the same trap. For them, as for us now, the sinful tendency of women, you know, remember the difference between our sin nature and our new nature, is this. Look at me. And look at me. Whereas for men, it was physically beating out the male competition, often to garner female attention for for women, the emphasis is more beauty-minded. That is external beauty-minded. We'll look at what true beauty, or beauty that matters to God, really consists of. For women, it's to garner male attention and to beat out the female competition. Yes, a Christian woman, or a Christian man for that matter, should want to dress and be attractive to their spouse. Not to openly display your wares or play one-upmanship. So yes, but, but an emphasis, let alone an overemphasis on outward appearance, especially to the detriment of what really matters to God, and thus what should really matter to us, 
is completely improper for those who profess, as it says, to know God, love God, and follow God. That's my paraphrase of God. Now let's look at the beauty that really matters to God. True beauty that Christian women are to focus on, reorient themselves around, rather than all this external ostentation, seduction, dog eat dog, and feeding on insecurities, and disparaging one another. That's the way of the world, and it sucks. But God has a much better way, and He wants us to find ourselves cherished and secure in Him and what He desires. And that is, on the one side, an inner beauty, modesty, and self-control. And on the other, outer beauty, shocker, good works. Mm. Hey, wait, mm. did I see that coming? Mm -hmm. But that's what's really beautiful to God. Mm -hmm. And men, what should be really beautiful to us as well. Look for a godly woman who invests in doing good, not just the charm and the flash and the sex appeal. As Proverbs 31, 30 tells us, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears Yahweh is to be praised. So first, the inner beauty of modesty and self-control. Christian women, it says in verse nine, should adorn themselves with modesty and self-control. How so very contrary to the spirit of our age and every age it would seem, this is the difference between focusing on outward appearance versus focusing on matters of the heart. As it says in 1 Samuel 16, verse seven, so way back. So again, nothing new under the sun. Man looks on the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks on the heart. Or as the Apostle Peter counsels in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, very similar word, he says, Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair, the putting on of gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart, with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very that's what's beautiful to God and for all who see with God's eyes. And when Paul counsels, uh, well, so, so the question is, whose eyes or attention are you wanting to draw, right? Who are you wanting to notice you? And, and when Paul counsels modesty, it's not that you have to have clothing up to your neck and down to your ankles. It's just a matter of not telegraphing sex. And it's not also, as perhaps you've heard as a slogan, that modest is hottest. Uh, because that's to fall into the same error. Because we're not trying to be hottest in any way, except for your husband. Sex is special. There's a God-designed sanctity to it. And your sexuality should be protected as special, not, not obscured as under a burqa by any means, but modest nonetheless. Again, whose eyes do you want to please? And self-control, not just giving free reign to everything you think. Uh, just because you think it doesn't mean you need to speak it. Right? Or anything you want to say or do, right? But under control. You, and you don't have to do everything that you impulsively want to do. Right? Look at the contrast. I'll just point, throw this out for you to look at later. In Proverbs chapter 9, the contrast between Lady Wisdom and Madame Folly. They're both women. But they are very different. In fact, for all of us, one of the chief fruits of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Galatians 5.23, is self-control. How can we do it? Well, it's not me. It's Him. It's not about me just buckling down and trying harder. It's rather it's about me leaning into His grace yes. and strength. Yes. Okay, and then second, the outer beauty, 
good works. Christian women should adorn themselves, it says in verse 10, with what is proper for women who profess godliness. That is, that you profess to know, love, and follow God. And that is with good works. And again, kind of like what we looked at earlier, this is what is called upon from us all, as it says in Matthew 5, verse 16. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. In fact, it is what we are all created for. Right after Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, which we're all probably very familiar with, comes verse 10. Listen. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. So works has got nothing to do with it, except that he continues in verse 10 and says works has everything to do with it. The question is whether it's on the front end or the back end. It can never be on the front end, but it equally strenuously must always be on the back end. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So yes, it's for us all, just like before when we look at the men, prayers for us all, but in particular, or the particular point of emphasis and reorientation, the men, so similar also here in particular, it's placed on Christian women as a mark of reorientation, of focus and intention in contrast to what is our natural inclination and society's emphasis so shallow and external, so often self-centered and sexualized. Later on in this epistle, in chapter 5, verses 9 and 10, the commendation for elderly widows is this. That she has been faithful to her husband and has a reputation for good works. If she has brought up children, has shown hospitality, has washed the feet of the saints, has cared for the afflicted, and has devoted herself to every good work. I mean, there you see the prominence of those good works as the mark of commendation and support for that exemplary subset of Christian women elderly widows. We'll get there later. So ladies, let me ask you. Is your focus on doing good? Finding ways to be involved in other people's lives to breathe life, to show compassion, to care and to counsel, to lead and support, to train and build up, to nurture and heal, etc., etc., it was testified of Jesus in Acts 10.38 that he went about doing good. What kind of works did Jesus do? And then consider what good works can you become involved in which will show forth your beauty, which is the beauty of Christ. When I began, I talked about what we want versus what he wants. And even Jesus, when pleading in the garden right before the cross, confessed, Mark 14, 36, yet not what I want, but what you want. So when it comes to us as men and women living as Christians, but living in this culture, we are torn, torn between what we want by nature, sin, not new, torn between what our culture touts applause and expects and what our Lord wants. And it gets metal shut some. I mean, I think I mentioned it, but I'm sure I've made many a man and woman, woman uncomfortable in this place this morning, myself included. But the question remains in my life, and you can each personalize it. In my life, what will it be? Will it be what I want, or what he wants. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that challenges us at the core of who we are, who we, what we think, and, and what we want.
And, and so, Lord, even as we have come and, and your word has uh, divided our joints and marrow, however it's described in Hebrews, uh, boy, we just ask that as we are exposed by your truth, that we might uh, embrace not only your wound, but your healing, and that you would knit us back together in ways that are more pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let us respond with that prayer on our hearts by singing both hymns, Have Thine Own Way, Lord, and I Surrender All. Please stay.
song. There may be tendrils that are tugging you back to not give everything to Him, but let the Holy Spirit override those instincts of your flesh to draw you completely over to Him. And as you walk in His way, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. May the grace of Christ our Savior and the love of God Thank you.